Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. Um, this, uh, this event, Likely Stories, Chaos and Cosmos, is a part of AIGA Baltimore's Design Month this October, which is coming to an end. Um, but we're excited to have Lori as well as our panelists here. Um, we're going to introduce them in a second, but I just wanted to give a little uh, background on our organization. So I'm Frances Miller, president of AIGA Baltimore. Um, if you haven't joined any of the Design Month's events yet, um, you might not be familiar with our theme, but you'll start to see from the uh, screen that was just up and from our backgrounds, um, our theme is inside out, and that's going to relate to what we're discussing tonight. Um, but really the inspiration for that is related to the pandemic and this last two years of everything going on and how right now we're feeling hopeful and excited, but at the same time, you know, a lot of us are still feeling not great and that's okay. And so we're kind of trying to welcome all those emotions we're having in person and virtual events and trying to join together from all different ways. So we really appreciate you coming out here. Um, from your homes or from wherever you are. Uh, and hopefully um, at the end of this, uh, you'll get the chance to turn off your mic as well if you're comfortable doing so or comment in the chat and talk to us and tell us your own stories. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> with all that, uh, AIGA Baltimore is uh, Charm City's chapter of AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. And our mission is to advance design as a professional craft, a strategic tool, and a vital cultural force. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about our chapter, membership, and volunteer opportunities, including board leadership, as well as event volunteering opportunities, you can visit us at baltimore.aiga.org. Um, and then I'm going to bring up Raquel Castedo, who is on our board as well as Soda Baltimore, our co-host for tonight. So. She'll be telling you a little bit more. Hi, Francis. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are very happy to have you all with us. Um, so my name is Raquel Castedo. I'm a member of AAG Baltimore's board as programming chair and also a member of SODA, which stands for Society of Design Arts. We're ve uh, very happy with this collaboration with AAG Baltimore and also with Stevenson University um, that has been uh, partnering with us the, for uh, a year. Um, so SODA was founded over 15 years ago in Baltimore by an all volunteer group of teachers, students and design professionals. All of them were very passionate about the multiple histories of design arts, including graphic design, illustration, architecture, book arts, photography, and many more. SODA has provided more than 100 programs that have explored diverse subjects in the past years. And if you want to have a better idea of our past programs, please check out our website, uh, sodabaltimore.com. And while you're there, sign up on our mailing list to find out about future events. In our website, you're going to see that we have been partnering with AJ Baltimore and building together a community interested in design history and its positive impact on design practice and contempor contemporary life. If you're interested in helping to plan, research, and present programs, please feel free to reach out to us. We are very excited to have you this evening. And now I want to say hi and welcome our panelists. Um, so, First, I want to welcome La Laurie Rubling. Laurie is Professor of Art and Graphic Design at Stevenson University. Professor Rubling was recently appointed Faculty Director of Exhibitions for Stevenson University. Hi, Laurie. Hi. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Uh, we have also next to Lori, and it's amazing that we're having an, you know, an in-person uh, hybrid event, um, Richard Stanley, who is also part of SODA, uh, retired from corporate and studio design work. He currently freelances, occasionally teaches at area colleges and universities and pursues um, fine arts interests. Hi, Richard, welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, we want to welcome 
to um, invite to join us Rakisha Metzger. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Kisha is a student at the Institute um, for Doctoral Studies and the Visual Arts, pursuing a degree in philosophy, aesthetics, and art theory, a working mom, and adjunct professor at MICA. She's an art teacher at Hamden Christian School. Thank you for joining us. And I want to invite to Ebony Kinney. Uh, Ebony is a design and communications professional, as well as a market research analyst with over 20 years in the industry. Hi, Ebony, welcome. Hi. So I want to pass now uh, to Lori, and let's get started. Thank you. Um, so folks, the first uh, thing we're going to do tonight is I, we have a second camera and um, what we're going to do is uh, um, I'm going to walk around the gallery with the camera and just look at the show. So this is uh, Likely Stories, Chaos to Cosmos. And um, Raquel, just to let you know, the, I don't see the camera on the screen, but that's just me. Good. Thank you. Right. Good. Thank you. So, um, can all the panelists join? I guess now. How do we do that? Okay. Good. All right. Um, so, I am going to share some notes, um, and uh, I guess Raquel, if we could have all four panelists up now, that would be great. Um, just give you some overview and notes and some definitions for what the show is about. And then um, the four of us are just gonna have a conversation around um, what, what we have going on here. So Likely Stories, Chaos and Cosmos is a drawing installation. I think of it as a drawing installation and it represents my, repre uh, my attention to and understanding in ways that uh, cosmology concepts help us what we remember help us remember what we know and, um, and how we know it. So it has a lot to do with memory. Um, I am taking my cues and, um, with a, from a historical uh, pre-Socratic pre philosopher. His name is Anaximander. 
and he uh, is considered to be the first Western European author of architectural theory. And he imitated, what he did is he um, was observing celestial patterns, and then he uh, imitated uh, through mimesis what he observed into three-dimensional models. And uh, the three models that he produced, a celestial fear or armillary, a sundial or a gnomon, the gnomon would be the language he used, and a T-map, which is a circular uh, representation of the three known continents at the time, two main rivers and three ocean seas. Um, yes, so the installation is the beginning of a creative inquiry um, and a new way of working for me, and I'm calling it um, play. And it's um, my uh, attempt to merge my three areas of research and content. So it's drawing, architectonics, and metaphysics uh, philosophy inquiry. Depending upon how you look at it, there are four or five stories in play here. Um, circle to a line or diagrams, straw, uh, cross cut of a giant sequoia tree, a ruler, sequoia ruler, which is the full length of a giant sequoia tree, 279 feet. Um, and um, yep, and then infinity drawings. So these, the drawing behind me and the drawings to our left are, um, I call them infinity diagrams. And um, in my mind, they are simply records of their making, records of a, the drawing process, and, um, and definitely a set of constraints, media constraints, and were inspired, are inspired by Edwin Abbott's Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. And then the, the wall, the hypertext typology wall, which is the last side of the gallery that I showed you, is a, a visual map of four um, themes in my thinking. So pattern recognition, memory and remembering perception and how to imagine. Uh, the wallpaper surface design right to my, over my shoulder is um, a visual fear, field of figure ground tension. And if, when you're in the space, um, you uh, get, get this feeling of things in motion kind of tumbling down as, and uh, harmony, or basically it kind of graphically represents chaos and cosmos. And then lastly, the, actually the first object that I you know, interacted with in the gallery, the Odrotic, um, is a 3D representation of a, of a character uh, in um, a Franz Kafka short story called Cares of a Family Man. Good. So um, when, we were, uh, when Raquel and I started to discuss um, uh, perhaps including the exhibition for the AIGA's design month, um, I thought um, the way we could, or a good connection is uh, how might we share um, ideas around COVID, ideas around disruption through storytelling. And um, just to let you all know, the, the, the title of the exhibition, Likely Stories, Chaos and Cosmos, is attributed to my St. John's um, tutor, Ava Brand, and she uh, uh, for a semester. She tutored me in, uh, many of us, in metaphysics. And uh, basically, she started the course out with this statement that all knowledge begins with likely stories. So what do we mean by a likely story? I understand it uh, to be how an experience begins to evolve into, a pra into practical or cultural knowledge, and then over time, through discussion and debate, true opinion emerges. So that's, uh, that's a pretty good definition, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ebony and uh, Rakisha and Richard have all seen the exhibition. Um, so uh, I'm, opening back, I'm opening up to you. <laughs> what would you like to say and, um, about the theme, uh, Likely Stories? Well, if I could start, um, I actually like the fact that you started off with this idea of play. And then not only did you start off with that idea of play, you actually pushed the, uh, what is this? The Odrotic mm -hmm. and putting that into motion. And the same thing that you said with um, the way that you put your background up uh, where we are in and out of the space, um, again, inside out actually, um, but we are drawn in and then we also come out. And so the sound that every time it rolled Again, I felt a vibration of some sort where I was drawn in, but then I was pressed back out. And I was drawn in and I was pressed back out. 
So that idea of play um, really resonated with me when you actually use the word to talk about how your, um, your exhibition actually is, is coming together and what you're using play to do. Good, thank you. Yeah, and for, for me, um, so after the first time I saw the exhibit, you know, you kind of come out of the exhibit and you have in your mind why it's called that, right? Without having had the conversation with you. And what I really got, and I'm glad it, it resonates with what I'm, I'm hearing also in the explanation, is that likely stories, it's almost as if we are at a point where as accurate as we can get is what is likely. And maybe the more we bring in stories and narratives, we get even to possibility. Where of course there was a point where we were at predictability. So that's um, what I'm feeling that the stories take us to a more human place. Well, stories, uh, there are so many different stories that are uh, on the walls all around. And uh, yeah, every story, uh, every person visualizing it is looking at it through their own stories, their collected experiences. and perceptions. And uh, so you're drawn to the particular stories that you're interested in. I like semiotics. So I go right to the diagram. It looks like that. Um, I love the geometric drawings and so forth, because that's something that uh, I, you know, I admire and, and would like to do. So there are many different things to do. And in, in the stories that we have, we bring to the exhibit. So um, that's why I found it very enriching. And these are, of course, all likely stories because they're here. I can see them. Uh, and so I'd like to see that carried forward in, into my own work. It certainly has influenced me and gotten me thinking a lot about the subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard, you, you started just inquiring, like talking to your friends, yeah. doing some great field research. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and uh, what did you... Um... What, what were some of the conversation you had about? Uh, oh, well, I had, uh, I had been thinking about stories, you know, how do you define a story? What constitutes one, uh, an individual story and how you're influenced by it. So I started to uh, just ask people that were in different professions, you know, what their perception of stories was, how they would define it. Um, a filmmaker friend of mine uh, thinks of stories uh, serially where you have a, uh, an image and a sequence of narrated images um, and you have to have layers on top of that. So there are many stories in intertwined. Uh, another conversation was with a friend of mine who was a retired judge, was uh, uh, in youth court. And uh, so I asked him, you know, how did he perceive the stories from the people that were in front of him? And he said, the thing that I always had to remember was that there's always two stories going on. There is the story that you're being told by the individual. There is your own story that you're always looking and filtering and reacting to. And you have to be very careful to keep those two in mind. So you're aware of the fact that you've got two different stories going on. And uh, I think uh, with this piece about the stories, I guess the stories, it's like, how many stories do you need until you make up the truth? You know, and if we're looking at, I, I think it's it's figure or axis, one of those pictures that uh, that's over there, Lori, on the wall. Um, I don't know if you want to show. It reminds me, if you look at it a long time, it looks almost like a 3D of, um, I don't know, it looks, of course, celestial and the cosmos, but I'm also seeing like bicycle spokes. So I'm thinking about the integrity of a bicycle wheel. So Raquel, if you had the bicycle. Raquel, can you turn on the mic? Yeah, yeah. it's gone this one here mm -hmm. and and i'm thinking like if you don't have i'd heard this definition of integrity it's it's a universal definition not so unique but just talks about how the integrity is is made up of the spokes so if the spokes were removed the wheel wouldn't have integrity it wouldn't hold weight and so the stories for me now are the spokes in this conversation so how many stories make up the truth make up something that's grounding that you can stand on or build something on Yeah, that's an interesting observation because the idea of the wheel uh, is a universal, it, you know, so the timely timeliness of it revolves, it comes back on itself, uh, as opposed to something that's linear, uh, which goes in one direction. And the wheel is in the spokes and so forth are all like 
like because uh, I had imagined it like a tree or a river where you'd have the, the main piece would be fed by tributaries or branches. But this is, in fact, a better way to look at it. And I'm glad you pointed that out because the spokes of the wheel tends to make a universality out of it rather than just a linear progression. Maybe, maybe in that same vein or a little different, when I'm thinking about this uh, story of the wheel is that, again, every time we tell that story, a new story forms from that story because we are reinventing that story that was told from the first time that we heard it. Um, because we may actually put our own selves into that story and think about how did we get to that story or what did we get from that story when we first heard it. Um, and I'll say like even those access points, you know, I, I looked at the work and I wondered like, well, why do they just stop at the edge of the paper instead of going onto the wall into those uh, <laughs> behind the background? You know, because it, it seems to me that it, it keeps us trapped inside, um, which again, like these boxes that we're in right now, and I know we talked about this before, but you know, what these boxes do is that right now we're talking to each other and the, this four, the four of us, but there are other people that are out there that can actually see us. So again, if we go outside of the box, then that's how those stories start to travel. And that's how they start to become stories that we can continue to tell and then add to our own interpretation of what we're getting from those stories. Gosh, that is uh, just beautiful and elegant. And um, you know, uh, the, the typology wall right has four themes: uh, pattern recognition, um, and then the art of memory or remembering, uh, perception, and then how to imagine. Um, and uh, it's also, folks, uh, it's also my syllabus for aesthetics. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I just want to, um, mimesis, right, is an important uh, kind of emergent characteristic of aesthetics. And of course, all that or sense perception, right, starts with our five senses. And, um, and it's in the, and Plato uh, has um, wrote or, you know, talks about the myth of recollection, right? And the notion that we are um, uh, can remember or feel connected to our ancestors' memory, right? Um, even though perhaps you know they're no longer uh, physically with us. And so, Rakisha, you're just beautiful of 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 that comment. Um, I'm also reminded of uh, so Sue Johnson, who um, came in and saw the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, she just said, "Laura, you know um, the the crosscut straw drawing on the wall, right?" That like you, Rikisha, all these drawings would probably be as impactful or more impactful if they were directly on the wall and, and weren't necessarily contained by an edge. So I take that um, uh, really well. And thank you for that. It's really interesting. Uh, the box, though, has, has always been a part of um, one of my uh, um, aesthetic concerns, mm -hmm. definitely, right? And um, so just, uh, I guess, as a, as a, totality of this the show right the show is a 40 years of work right you know um it's come out of 40 years of exploration and of working um and that uh the box and how do the box unfold how do we unfold um there's a future and a past you know moving with our action our being in time right now is important do you think of the box metaphorically then it's simply it's, it's a container for the work that you've done over that period of time it is uh it is uh functions as a form mm -hmm. right as a an analogy um not necessarily a metaphor but as an analogy right. as a situation okay um i guess i to be very specific the way um, sides of a box just fold, just animate, uh -huh. um, is truly uh, interesting to me. <laughs> so, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, like a stage where you're, you yes. have the three walls and then somebody breaks the fourth wall. Exactly. And so the, yes. the walls of that box are mm -hmm. permeable as well. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, the drawings are, you know, of the imagination, right? Where the installation is in the world and is shareable, right? Becomes the model. Um, that's interesting. What's interesting about the box for me, as you all are talking through it, is that it, it also is like a capture. It's like the snapshot. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about accessibility, like not 508, but like um, it's, it's uh, approachable, approachability. Mm -hmm. It's like, where do you create that? So let's say that at one point it was that um, a higher thought, you know, art, really elite art was not as approachable maybe. And that was a part of the journey. 
So now that we're bringing in stories and narratives and uh, sometimes something, things that are more approachable, it's like, how does that change the art? How does it change the experience of the art? And does it then validate maybe that we need the box just as a construct? Like it's like, it's a handle on a thing. Yeah. And it's that common shared touch point, right? That then yeah. uh, we bring, um, you can, we can ask, well, what, what's Lori up to, right? But then of course we, we can also ask what we bring to it. Um, Ebony, you want to share uh, your comment or I, I'm interested for you sharing it with everyone. You're thinking around zeros and ones. Well, yeah, the, the minute uh, that you were telling me about the circles and lines and began to read and see how it really showed up in the art, that's what came up for me, that binary that is at the core of computer programming. And just that, you know, well, one, on one hand, it's like, you know, that's the fundamentals. That's as core base level as you can get to is these zeros and ones that all framework is sort of built on top of. And so how much more so also the circles and the lines. So you think about a circle and a line maybe so in that bike analogy, it makes up the whole piece. It has movement and it has stillness, you know? So it takes you from the stillness to the 3D and, and on. So um, yeah, just that binary kind of piece as a foundational, um, very at the core and, and that you have to span out so far. You have to kind of zoom out so far in your mind to just say, how can I make things fit in two categories? Am I going to move or stop, right? It's like, you can't be too detailed to get to, to that, um, that binary viewpoint. Thank you. Um, it's so interesting. Hopefully we'll get back to straw, the straw drawing, the wall drawing and the bamboo drawing, but um, we're getting some questions being asked right now. So uh, really good questions like, where can we see the show? <laughs> And I'll make sure that we type that in the in the chat line, but it's um, on the Green Spring campus of Stevenson University in the art gallery, which is just um, located in the theater lobby. Uh, this coming uh, Sunday, November 7th from 1230 to 2, there's going to be a reception. So if you'd like to come see the show and hang out with me and, you know, uh, your new best friends, um, <laughs> uh, that would be a great time. And the show will be open um, through, let's say, December 20th. I think, uh, and then we have, yeah, and then the next exhibition comes up in the fall, and it's 1525 Green Spring Valley Road, uh, 21153. So when did, um, yes, yeah, so I started working on this exhibition about a year ago. Um, I was tapped by uh, um, the exhibition director, um, previous exhibition director, to um, uh, be the featured faculty of Stevenson University. And um, I started from a very kind of uh, pedestrian, like, okay, I'm gonna just put a bunch of my infinity drawings on the wall, the one behind me, uh, cause it was a series I was working on. And then um, of course, then I said, oh, I can challenge myself, challenge myself more than that. And then I set out for about seven months um, uh, to really iterate, uh, working in my sketchbook, imagining tons of scenarios and thinking about, um, uh, I guess definitely um, thinking about disruption and climate change. So that came in um, to my thinking and um, a, a new thought, like typically I stay kind of ideal and, and abstract, right? Um, so uh, the, um, anyway, so climate change came into my thinking. Uh, Raquel was involved and uh, she goes, Lori, how are you gonna get color into this space? <laughs> And uh, that was the challenge. I said, I don't know, but how, how am I going to get uh, color into it? And that's when the, um, the wallpaper came up, uh, came in. And the imagery for the wallpaper is uh, basically uh, an inventory of, um, of shapes, glyphs, and uh, forms that, um, that sometimes I've built uh, uh, three-dimensionally, you know, architectural spaces, um, the odratic, and um, of course, game-like uh, bits and pieces of things. Um, yeah, I had a team of three students, uh, Angel Rudder, Tana Marshall, and Rebecca Doyle, who were my assistants, who helped me install the show. We started installing end of May, and we finished mid-August. So um, that's cool. Yeah. I hope I answered that correctly. Um, how did the pandemic, man, how did the pandemic, I, I, guess I really wanted to be physical again. I think ultimately, I mean, the first thought was um, just challenging myself physically. And um, yeah, I, I really am thinking about disruption and how 
um, I, touch points and things that we all value and understand are no longer kind of in play. Uh, and I'm trying to imagine how might we figure out what's important, you know, what we should be paying attention to um, and relate to things. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that, Richard? Well, it, it's a, uh, I had thought going back, adding on to Ebony's uh, comment about the, the circle and the line. Uh, direct uh, reaction that I had when I saw the sequoia cross section and the, and the, uh, the measuring uh, stick of that was that the trunk of the tree seems to me to be the line and the growth rings that come out from that are the circular elements. And so if you're thinking of, of the tree as a timeline, a life timeline and as the growth rings as being the accretion of the uh, stories that you hear and how it adds to the knowledge and the strength of the tree, uh, you're really looking at it as a growth uh, symbol with the tree and the, the line and the circle together. So that was a direct reaction uh, uh, to this. Uh, as far as the pandemic was concerned, um, for me, uh, since I didn't have a, a job that I went to anyway and so forth, I was able to start concentrating on a new uh, type of photography that I was working on uh, or uh, some just because I had limitations. I couldn't, I couldn't go outside my yard. So the, the limitation was you have to use your iPhone. It has to be inside the house or in the yard. And that's it. That's all you get. And so I did that for a year. And uh, on my website there, that's a series called the bunker photographs. So anybody's interested, but it was fun. It was a good, it was a limitation that turned out to be very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rakisha and Ebony, the question is out there, you know, from the audience, how, um, how did the pandemic impact the work process for you? Oh, I can go, okay. So um, for me, what it challenged me to do was to tell my stories through um, social media. So, and my husband, he actually, he told me, he said, you only have nine pictures on your social media You've been on um, Instagram for, you know, I think since 2009. And so he, he gave me this challenge that, um, you know, if you're, he said, if you, don't, if you don't put pictures up, you might as well throw it away. <laughs> so because of that challenge, I've been posting every day. And every day someone gets a different piece of my life added to theirs, or again, a story that's added to their story about, hmm, I never thought about things that way. So then I get people inboxing me or they'll tell me that, you know, they had fun reading something or it made them think about, you know, things that they hadn't thought about before. Um, and then also it puts a different spin on things. So the reason why I add to my, um, my introduction, why I added those things is because it's important to what's going on in my life right now at this moment. And so again, you get to see a piece of me being in school. So sometimes I'll show a little snippet of my paper. Sometimes you'll see my children. Sometimes you'll see my husband. Sometimes, again, you see the work that I'm doing with my students at um, Hamden Christian School. So it has a, it, it's allowed me to put things in boxes, but then also, again, those things come out of the box when other people get a chance to witness what's unfolding, as you said, Lori, and what happens in those boxes. Once people hear, they see the picture first, and it draws them into what's happening and what comes in uh, with the story. Great. Um, I think for me, everything intensified during the pandemic. So it like sent me within, it sent me to that sort of research and observe mode, you know, watching and scanning my environment, uh, which was good because it helped me to kind of see uh, people and kind of come from a place where I'm appreciating what is, what's coming from people and then who I am distinctly. So it's made my own voice maybe a little bit stronger even during that time and whatever it is that I create, so. Cool, I, I, we wanna follow up on this. One of our um, guests, right, uh, um, a part of the webinar has a question for you. Um, how did it feel to reflect on art that has been made pre-pandemic? Did it affect the way you choose to convey your art or in your case, design to your audience? Um, certainly brought in, yes, I would say, yes, I would say if I'm thinking, it certainly brought in a, a matter of like, what are people thinking and feeling even more? So being in usability, I'm already concerned about what are people thinking and feeling, but you know, the way it is communicated to me is how they navigate a page, how they, how they navigate something. 
a web page or an application or even a design. So in this case, I'm thinking even before it reaches surface level, you know, how is what they're thinking and feeling affecting their mood and, and what's, what are they bringing to the space wherever I may encounter them? I, I just want to add here that um, uh, Ebony has a, a is, is has work in a show at Stevenson in the Ken, Kevin Manning Academic Center, the second floor art gallery, and it's called uh, Creative Research Processes. Um, hmm. uh, Sue Johnson, um, Ebony, and uh, Johan Lowy. So um, your research, your field research uh, in um, Rwanda, right, mm -hmm. uh, is a uh, beautiful, really interesting um, wall, a uh, pinup wall. And there's a website, maybe uh, Ebony, you can like type all that business into the um, chat sure. line for everyone to connect yeah. to. Uh, it's yeah. been really great. Um, and the, you know, this exhibition is a, um, is a, about sharing creative processes as much as it is looking at finish work. And, and then the creative research processes um, installation on the uh, Owings Mills North Campus is also just inspiring and showing design students, showing oh, anyone who wants to, to see three distinct uh, variations of the research process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds interesting. I haven't seen oh, those yet. Yeah, I'm um, looking forward to seeing that now. Yes, and that that'll actually that closes around November seventeenth, so oh, we okay. need to see it sooner than later. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So, um, Jay Jamal Bennett, to everyone, share. Um, oh, semiotics. Ah, uh, uh, yes. And I guess uh, actually, folks, now um, you know we're halfway through um, tonight's webinar. If you would like to join the conversation. Uh, you are invited to raise your hand. Um, so, um, uh, SART, oh, SART and semiotics, please. Hmm. SART. Uh, <laughs> that's really, an, uh, the, the, for me, semiotics has got a couple of different flavors. And uh, it, although it started as a linguistic study, uh, nevertheless, I've left it into that linguistic side where the SART and uh, the SSRA and people like that are, and I'm taking it over into the visual side. So I'm looking at it from the standpoint of semiotics being uh, an analysis of form, content, and context. And I think all of the stories that we hear or that we tell have a subject and they are communicated to people in some form or another, whether it's visual, verbal, et cetera. And they go to someone, the context, and the context, of course, can be an audience of people that are of like mind or that need convincing otherwise or something like that. Uh, and so my process has always been to try to analyze the messages I'm putting together, whether in a personal photograph or whether it's a graphic design, a corporate identity or something like that in those terms. And so I, I can't really comment on the literal, uh, the literature or uh, that side of things, I'd be happy to turn that over to you. I yeah. think know more about it than I do. <laughs> you know, I, I am not, I, I don't necessarily pay attention to Sark, but I paid attention to his partner, De Beauv um, Simone de Beauv um, golly, Beauvier. Beauvier, yep. And recently, um, uh, her thinking around how meaning is constructed. So, you know, again, we're in the mid 20th century, um, uh, kind of shared universals are waning. We're emerging in postmodern thinking, right? Rejecting mm -hmm. the uh, modernist universal. And um, she frames um, philosophic inquiry, um, metaphysics as this uh, in inquiry into meaning. And of course, the meaning is subjective. It begins at the subjective, your meaning, you know, my meaning. Um, actually, all of uh, our understandings, right? Begins with sensorial simulation, and then it um, gets processed uh, chemically, right, uh, in our brain synapses, and um, and then it connects up with other previous memories that are collected up there, and then we start making relationships, or as uh, Charles Peirce would call it, the abductive process, right? It's very open-ended, um, uh, and it's a, it is literally remembering as opposed to um, uh, knowing the answer to something. So it's always in a process of um, uh, of uh, our understanding evolving. You can open the mic up now, Raquel. Huh. Yeah. Jamal, you're gonna are you gonna talk with us? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about Jamal's question in terms of whether he's opening it up yeah. to uh, uh, the stylistic or the meaning right. process yeah. or because uh, all of the paintings of Picasso, for example, do tell stories. Guernica totally. is certainly yeah. a story. Well, and uh, the, the stories of the men with civil death and the yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, they all are like that. Okay, uh, we're trying to get the um, uh, the participation from the audience to work, but we're having some trouble. Uh, I'm wondering, Rakesh or, um, or Ebony, do you um, uh, have you studied much around how Picasso's appropriation of African art and the origins of that? I have an opinion about mm -hmm. it, but I'm wondering if, you, if either one of you um, would like to talk about that. Not directly, I haven't. Okay. And yeah, I'm I'm no expert on it by all, by any means, so um, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> um, but I do I do want to mention since we are um, adding to the conversation that I have a um, an ex or my work is in an exhibition as well. So I sent it to everyone um, in the link um, just because everybody was talking about what they're doing and what they're up to. Um, and funny enough, it's um, related to being in the box. And so the work is called I Get Out um, and it's by Lauren Hill. Um, and so she says, I get out of all your boxes. So um, yeah, if, if you wanna you know, see it and check it out, I did put the link um, in, in the chat so everybody can go and see it. Great, great. <laughs> Thank you, that's really helpful. And is, is Oakton Community College close by? So it's, it's actually in Chicago, but again, because of these, you know, virtual spaces okay. that we're in right now, and again, the yeah. coming in and going out and how we are able to share those stories. Um, one of my friends said, oh, you might be interested in this because it seems that your work um, relates to what they're doing here with this exhibition. And so I um, applied and yeah, and so my work is up now and I think until November sometime, so. Okay, excellent, right. thank excellent. you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, it looks like uh, Stephen King is raising their hand and, um, oh, I'm just watching Raquel. Raquel, we're ready to go whenever you are. Hi, Jamal, are you, um, do you, are you able to turn your mic on? I'm asking the question. Can you hear me awesome. now? Awesome. Yes, we hear you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, going back, maybe 18 steps backwards. <laughs> semiotics <laughs> because that was a, a struggle for me in college and as an adult because uh, Pablo Picasso he sure did rape Africa and he had so many dope pieces from every tribe across the continent based off of semiotics so I wanted to ask a question to the experts I have an opinion about that mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I, I, I'm just reacting to that. Uh, I'm actually, I'm interested, Jamal, in your reaction to it, in, in terms of uh, how the influence uh, uh, connects between uh, Picasso and, and uh, you know, the, the African art. I, I, I believe. No, da, 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 da. I believe he gave an avenue for the rest of this planet to understand the significance of Kiwawa Bambaba, Dan, everything Eastern African and everything Central African. I think he gave, before there was a uh, Facebook <laughs> many, many, many years ago, I think he gave an avenue for everybody that's in Europe to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And then he made it abstract. That was a thing. Like, why they have to twist it up like this? You mm -hmm. are Bombara is beautiful the way it is. Mm -hmm. I want to hear your words. Sure. Well, so, you know, um, what's so interesting about African art, uh, so in the, you know, right around the turn of the century, um, African art was starting to be shown in galleries in Paris. So that's how um, Picasso encountered it, as well as he encountered it at the Paris World's Fair, uh, 1900, 1904, right? So in addition to that, Japanese um, print making, right, prints were um, first shown in Paris in uh, 1863, uh, right? So 
and that spurned, uh, you know, talk about um, a thousand ships, um, that um, floating world space encouraged in, um, Europeans to understand uh, semiotics, figure ground very differently. But with, um, so what Pause. we see in Picasso- Semiotics, everything yeah. is significant. Every mask means something. So sure. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, it, it drove the nail home. I'm, I'm listening, go ahead. No, that's okay. So, so we get to, so straightforward semiotics is sign, right? A sign, a form. And then what mm -hmm. is it signifying? Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, therefore signification or meaning is then anchored to context, right? So mm -hmm. the African masks now is contextualized in Picasso's painting, as opposed to a, a ritual, uh, a community ritual, right? or well um you know a, a, a priest or a priestess right in my community well okay so now uh, is one better than the other more accurate than the other picasso is literally playing he is playing another influence of picasso's um uh, cubism is the mechanics of of uh, of a projector right so in um first uh, encounters of cinema you were really in a, in a department store, right? In a, mm -hmm. in a small room, the, uh, the projector was in the middle of the space, not behind us, right? And it's clickety clack and it's heat. And the, you know, the whole mechanism is what um, is a touch point for Picasso and Brock in their, uh, their initial analytical cubism. And they're trying to capture um, again, uh, well, the simultaneity, right? Of the machine, of what the machine is doing, and then the image that the mach machine is making. So in Mademoiselle de Avignon, again, I am not an art historian and um, yeah. I prefer to interpret, the, I like to interpret things, you know, like tell my own stories about stuff. So Picasso is just challenging our sense of beauty, our sense of um, perhaps history and, and aesthetics. The, and I'll stop talking in a minute. The other interesting thing about Picasso mm. is appropriation is of course, um, it is shocking, all right? And, and it's a new experience for us. The, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed yeah. it very well. Let me say my words. I enjoyed it very well. He um, saw something of beauty and let me take this back home. But he brought it back home for real. If you see his home, it's nothing but a warehouse for mm -hmm. yeah. From Bob and Dan and beautiful African art, he became a student of art. That's all I have to say about that. I just want to ask you about semiotics because semiotics, yeah. it, philosophically Eastern European, yeah, that's one thing. Walter Benjamin and then Sock and then. Pablo Picasso said, yo, this is what it is. I want to hear that, but go ahead, I'm done. Thank you yeah. so much. It's an interesting Thanks. subject, the whole idea of the, the idea of the form and the content. I've been curious, just the whole idea about masks, um, whether they're African masks or something Beautiful. else, New Beautiful. Orleans, you know, there is a, there's two stages to that. There's two stories going on there. The person that is wearing the mask has a story. The mask that they're putting on is another story. It may be complicated. And the dance they do with the mask. This is true. Yep. So you know, yep. it's a form content context thing, and, and you wear your mask. I think I'm talking too much right now. I'm gonna I'll log off. Jamal, Jamal Levi Strauss. So you know, you, we're touching in the world of anthropology, but there's a book called The Way of the Mask, and it's Claude, uh, Claude Levi Strauss's um an, my uh, grown ass research, man. I know him very well. The, an analysis the of the um, Inuit yeah. Eskimo. Uh, imagery. All done. Well done. Salute. Salute. Bye bye. Thank so I'll you. Take, I'll yeah. take a string of that conversation because I learned a lot of new stuff there. And just say we can have a very modern conversation right now about the small or you know local business that wants to brand itself. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to, they have an artist in their family. They're trying to bring culture to this logo mark branding extended extended and you have an industry that's saying oh that doesn't meet the industry standards for design and it won't resonate with people and that was the story and I wonder if that's still true I wonder if now that more 
um, culture is, and stories and textures being brought to the conversation about your about branding, is it true that it won't stick in people's minds if it's not symmetrical and it doesn't only convey one idea? And I hesitate to <laughs> tell people that anymore, you know? <laughs> and I, I said I wasn't gonna say anything or touch on it, but I also wanna bring up the controversy that goes along with um, Pablo Picasso and you know taking this idea of the mask and not giving credit to where he came up with the ideas of when he went and visited those um, African countries and came and brought it back and then put it in his work. And that how that's um, covered over, so to speak. Um, but again, it's an unfolding that continues to happen and that people are continuing to have um, issues with where they're you know, looking for the, the credit that was given. So although it might be, you know, right now a good thing that you're saying that, you know, oh, in Western, you know, culture, then uh, societies, you know, Pablo Picasso did a great thing. But again, he, he stripped away something and took it for himself, which again, as we know, has happened through colonization, you know, um, throughout the centuries that, you know, I mean, billions of years or however long you know, colonization um, has been going on where people take things from other cultures um, and then use it and misappropriate it. So I, I wanna bring that part of it in that it's not all a, a beautiful thing about Pablo Picasso and his mask. Totally, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Rakisha, for making sure that was said, it's really important. Um, but we also just exchanges, right? We're, you know, this constant exchange of, of um, opportunities. So I think Stephen, um, Raquel, can Stephen join us? Yep. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, fantastic. Um, I wanted to, a, a, a couple of things. One with the, um, back to the, to the sequoia tree and uh, the, I guess the, the, the lines that are there. I like the fact that it is off center. It, that that brings a sense of realism to it because people don't live in straight lines so i, I think that's uh, uh you know something that I, I appreciate it also you've mentioned metaphysics a couple of times just kind of on on the outskirts of, of these conversations and i want to go back to this pandemic in in i guess from from what my opinion is this pandemic did something that has never been done before worldwide everyone had to stop. And when everyone stopped, I think there was an additional metaphysical component that people became aware of. So as I venture through social media and I talk in you know, various apps and, and, and whatnot, I hear people talk about this new awareness. And I think people have kind of gotten away from the traditional religion and they have leaned into themselves during this time that they were stuck at home and come up with this inner spirituality slash metaphysical experience. And I just wanted to, to, to get the panel's opinion on that. Thanks. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> uh, Richard. Well, it, it's a, uh, yes, I, I think that that's the case. Uh, anytime you're in a form of isolation, and your normal uh, communications and stimuli and so forth are, are cut off or restricted, uh, you develop new coping mechanisms. And if uh, metaphysics, uh, if, if you put it on the spiritual end of the continuum and on the other end of the continuum is kind of a practical um, accommodation to the difficulties that you have, um, you know, who knows if, if somebody may start planting garden because they can't go out to the grocery store to buy groceries and they may become very involved in the whole ethos of getting into the earth and, and growing things and seeing something come to fruition and so forth. And that can be a, a metaphorical or I mean a metaphysical kind of manifestation of the physical activity they're doing. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I think yeah. even, well, I was just going to say, I think even, uh, off of that uh, on the spiritual aspect, I think even people of faith had, were, were uh, forced to kind of look at metaphysical because faith was, 
some people's faith may have been challenged because the pandemic made you say that just because there is a, you know, this thing, coronavirus, that my faith will not necessarily protect me from it. So where, you know, religion kind of would cover afterlife, uh, metaphysical can kind of cover your human experience right now. So I think even people of faith were kind of brought over to how am I maintaining and, and coping during this time while I'm still here, you know? So I, I agree with that as well. Um, and, uh, yep, and to jump off the, um, or to piggyback on those things, I think that it was a looking into ourselves too. Um, and I know that uh, when I was at the opening with Ebony, we talked about this source and we're trying to get back to understanding where the source of our getting back to ourselves is you know, coming from. So it gave us a uh, time to be silent with ourselves. And again, to really hear that inner, again, voice or the inner self that we know exists, but sometimes with all the busy and all the things that we had going on and still have going on, we haven't had time to really rest with it and really sit with, again, where our faith lies. If, um, again, we're talking about uh, you know, what Ebony brought up or again, um, what does it actually mean to exist and be in this space and in this time right now? Um, so a, a lot of, um, even with my work, as I've mentioned before, with um, posting on Instagram, it's about me getting back and understanding my position in this world. And I know that it's big, you know, before I might have thought that it, it was a small thing, but I think about how many people I'm touching through my stories, again, through my Instagram feed, where people, again, can even go back to the beginning. And, and that first picture that I uh, posted, it was, you know, maybe something about uh, the picture. And I asked this question about, you know, you thought that this picture was going to be of me and my son and how close he is to me. But really, this picture is about showing how God, how close God is to us. Or again, if you believe in God or whatever the thing is that you believe in, um, and that is just like this picture is showing the closeness um, that we are to it if we just stop and, you know, kind of have that moment um, to rest with it. Thank you so much. You know, uh, we're get, we have to wind this down and there's two things. Uh, there's a very interesting comment from Shirley Myers in the chat line. Um, but I just want to give everyone a definition here around metaphysics. So um, the origins of the uh, word come from Aristotle. Uh, it just means after physics and um, Aristotle's concept is that there are elementary things that then can recombine, right? So it's, it's a relationship of, a, of a, a material, a being, and then how it might become. <laughs> and then it evolves, you know, um, now we fast forward to uh, 21st century and I actually have notes on this, but I'm not gonna share them with you, but it is, very much uh, being and becoming is an extremely interesting subject and this um, appreciation that whatever state something is in now, right? Uh, we should um, allow ourselves to imagine other states it can be, other states it has been, right? In other words, we just shouldn't be complacent. And also we should enjoy the mis uh, our misunderstandings to emerge into an understanding. That that's Richard. No, that's, I agree. Okay, <laughs> and great. I think this should be part one of this conversation. There you go. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hey, can I plug in there? Can I plug in just right there that it takes the spiritual practices. Spiritual practices are a big part of metaphysical. So it's part of Science of Mind for a while. So I read that, I uh, studied that. It's the spiritual practices that get you to manifest something. And so that's the part in, of the human experience that's kind of like uh, dealt with uh, into guiding you into metaphysical. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, yeah, okay. Shirley did such a great job kind of talking about the circle to align diagrams um, in, the, in the gallery. So I'm just gonna let her statement um, be there. I just wanna thank Stephen and Jamal for participating uh, with us as a panelist and everyone for coming tonight. Um, the next soda talk, I think it's going to be Annette Cowenberg and her sewing circle. So we're gonna be setting that up in the next month. And um, I believe it's gonna be the 29th or the 30th of November. Um, so stay tuned to that. And um, yeah, Raquel Francis, uh, any, you want, do you need to say anything else right now before we sign off? They went home. They might've gone home. <laughs>
<laughs> We're gone. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to mention the next Latino Design Histories event? Yes, thank you so much. I forgot about that. That's the other thing. Yeah, good. Uh, yes, totally. I want to mention that uh, first, first, I want to say thank you to all our, our panelists. You did like a really great job. It was an amazing conversation, and I can't wait to see the recording and you know and 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 dig deeper on on some topics that you you know you 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 talked. Um, our next uh, soda event right after Annette is gonna be the Latino Design Histories event with. Patricia Lara Betancourt from Colombia and Livia Hezengi from Brazil. They're going to be talking a special edition that they edited, they co-edited for the Design History Society um, from London. They are partnering with us in this event with AJ Baltimore, Stevenson University, and AAJ Unidos. So it's November 18th. Please check out our website to more to see more details. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Raquel. Good night, everyone. Have a safe night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.